I'm going to start by doing some quickfire questions about this whole presentation. Uh, first of all, what is Compiler Explorer? I imagine the majority of you already know, but Compiler Explorer is a website where you type in your code on the left-hand side and you see what the compiler does with it on the right-hand side. Why? Why does Compiler Explorer exist? Well, the way that it's best described by a colleague of mine is it's an argument ender. You can take a piece of code that you think compiles in a particular way and you can show your colleague that it does in fact work as well as their code and you know in, in the case that I use it it's like you want to take something that is more human readable and show to somebody that it compiles to the same assembly as their disgustingly awful hand coded um, uh, mass of C like code. So that's why Compiler Explorer exists but it's used by other people for a lot of other things. Uh, when? Uh, Compiler Explorer has been around since about 2012. Uh, in 2012, this is what the site looked like. It was actually just called, rather generically, Interactive Compiler. Naming is not really a good thing for me. Um, it supported very little, and um, it, you know, it's sort of vaguely familiar looking right now. I hosted it on gcc.mypersonaldomain, uh, because it was the only thing I had available at the time, and it only supported GCC, and unfortunately, the domain name kind of has stuck. And so that's why I know a lot of you refer to it only as the domain name, which I will not, <laughs> as it's too weird. Um, in 2012, we had GCC and Clang. Uh, we only supported C++. The results were largely unfiltered. Uh, it was 5,000 lines of JavaScript. And it was just me doing it, and I was paying for it for myself outside of, out of my own AWS account. Fast forward 11 years, uh, and we've now got nearly 2,000 or more than 2,000 compilers, 50 languages, we have all sorts of filtering options, we have all sorts of tools, we can do diffs, we can do all sorts of things which I'll talk about today. It's 65,000 lines of TypeScript, and for those of you who don't know what TypeScript is, TypeScript is JavaScript with types, and it compiles to JavaScript, thus mixing all of the benefits of the long compile with the drawbacks of not really having proper types. Um, and I'm glad to say, it's not just me, I have an amazing team of volunteers, uh, many of whom, or two of whom, are in the audience here, so thanks to Austin and Partouf who are in the audience, um, but we have like six main, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> that'll embarrass them. Uh, and um, a number of other folks help out here. We've got Ruben, we've got Jeremy, we've got Mark, we've got uh, Super Greco, whose main name, real name I've forgotten, and uh, uh, Mark. Phew, I got them all. Um, and I'm glad to say I'm not paying for it out of my own pocket because I wouldn't be able to afford it. My wife would have words to say. It's all right when it's a couple of hundred bucks, maybe, as a hobby, but um, Compiler Explorer costs me about $2,000 a month at the moment, but it's well funded by patrons and some commercial sponsors. Uh, how does it work? Well, this is not about how it works, really. This is a simplified diagram of all the computers and services that are involved behind the scenes. It's complicated. Uh, who? Uh, obviously, I've told you who makes it, who uses it. I mean, most of you, I guess. Developers use it for argument ending or exploring the space. Trainers use it for showing people how to write um, a C++ without the complexity of installing things. Universities for pretty much the same reason. I know that some security researchers use it. Um, I know, for example, um, we've had people using the API to sort of um, teach a machine learning system, a large language model, what kind of um, bad assembly code output is generated by what kind of C++ input. And I believe the recent um, DeepMind um, sort algorithm improvements, they use Compiler Explorer to try and find the correct C input to generate the assembly code that their LLM had said would be the best output. So there's some cool pieces of people that have used it. And I know that some compiler authors and you know every other bug report you'll see in GCC or Clang will have a Compiler Explorer link on it to sort of demonstrate the bug. So it's very exciting. But today is about what's new in the site. And it would be dull if I just went through a big bullet list of, and then we added this, and then we added this. So I'm going to do this through the medium of user journeys. Uh, I'm going to invent some users and sort of hypothesize how they might use the site and the new features, some of which might not be all that new, but you might not know about. So I'm going to start with Jordan. Jordan is a low latency trader, so there's what, four, three, three per th trading firms in this, uh, in this room here, and for a, some of the, the work in a trading company, performance is really the only thing that matters. Maybe secondarily is um, correctness, or maybe first correctness. You know, the thing about high frequency trading is that you can make a lot of mistakes very, very quickly if your code is not right. Um, 
But Jordan writes trading systems for a living and is uh, kind of, I suppose, a proxy for me when I used to do that kind of thing. So I'm going to start, and this is where it's all going to start going pear-shaped because my timings all rely on my ability to use my own site, which you will see. Right, first of all, uh, hopefully that is just about readable. Yeah, I've got a thumbs up from the back. Fabulous. Um, so Jordan would like to replace some old school code that has been handed down to him from um, the code base that he's got that just literally sums up an array. Now, why would you want to sum up an array? I don't really know, but it suits my purposes. Sorry, it's not quite fitting on the screen. I'm going to do one reduction. Is that still visible at the back? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, now things fit. Wonderful. So we've got... Uh, a pointer to an array, a number, and we're going to run over it, and we're going to sort of use an old-school for loop. And I can't help but notice that Sean Parent is staring me down at the moment for, for writing a raw loop. But we're going to change that. So Jordan would like to show to his boss that this is going to be okay. We can make this transformation, and we're not going to lose anything. Or if we do lose something, it's worth the trade-off. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to add a new uh, editor down the bottom here. And I'm going to take my code from the top and paste it into the bottom. And I'm going to remove the, that version from that. So now in the top window, I only have like the old version. And in the bottom, I'm going to have only the new version that I would like it to be, which is going to use std accumulate. And, oh, you can't see this one, and I'm not going to zoom out anymore, but like it's literally what you'd imagine. std accumulate array, array plus none, zero. And I'm sure we could use ranges and some things like that, but I'm an old, old person. Uh, so... At the moment, all we've got is two editor windows and one um, assembly view. And I need to be able to add a new compiler. And I can drag it over to here. And um, I'm going to just copy the flags from there to the bottom. So what I now have is a set of the uh, top half is the uh, old code and its output. And the bottom half is the new code that I would propose moving to. And that's kind of... OK, I can scroll up and down a bit, and uh, I can sort of, sort of, maybe I can make some kind of assessment about whether those are better or not. But Compiler Explorer supports, and has always supported, actually, um, sort of a more complicated tiling. So I can actually drag these windows around and put them as tabs. So in this instance now, I can actually get the code side by side. You can't actually see the C++ code anymore. It's hidden in a tab in each of those two half of the windows. And maybe now this is a little bit better. Maybe I can make a... Uh, a some kind of estimation about whether they're the same or not. But it's much easier if I get the computer to tell me what the differences are, right? So um, whereas when I'm adding a compiler, I have to add it to an existing window so that I know what the compiler needs to output, uh, sorry, what the compiler output needs to be of, what editor it's associated with, I want to add a window at like the very, very top. So I'm going to go to the very top here and do more, add diff view. And I can drag that down here. And in fact, I'm going to maximize it. There's a little maximize button there, which is probably too small to see. And now I've got a difference view. And unfortunately, it used to default to the two obvious cases, but I need to pick the two there. So now I can actually diff the results of the two assembly codes side by side. And what you might take back from this is that you know, there's roughly the same number of instructions. There's maybe a few more on the right-hand side. There's a few more shifts than there were on the left-hand side. OK. I mean, that's maybe worth a conversation. But if I scroll down to the part here, with, uh, denoted by .l4, down to the jne.l4, that's like the core loop. That's going to be doing most of the heavy lifting of this algorithm. And if I'm doing big arrays of these things, it's going to spend most of its time inside that loop. And I can see on, from the left and the right here, these lines, let me just highlight so that you can see them. These lines here, and they're corresponding on the other side, they are identical with the exception of one register being different. So I can be pretty confident that those two loops are going to execute in the same amount of time. I mean, it's always worth benchmarking these things, of course, but just as a matter of first principles, you could sort of say, look, the code for the, the core loop is going to be the same. And so that might be enough to win the argument. But we can do more than that. We can say, well, as well as it being absolutely identical, I can actually tell you how fast that's going to go, or how fast we think it's going to go. So what I've just done is I've selected and I've copied the code into the clipboard and I'm going to close that window down. And in fact, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say reset the UI layout, reset code and UI layout. So we're now back to the default view. My clipboard still has that little snippet of the core of the code. And while we're here, I should show you a cool feature. If you've ever done this or if you've ever clicked a link that's taken you to a new layout and then you've gone, oh, but I was working on something really important in Compiler Explorer. I've just lost my work. I mean, first of all, 
don't rely on Compiler Explorer to do your work, right? <laughs> but if you have, we can actually go up here in the more, and there is a history. And we keep an auto-save history of the last few states of the whole layout of the site. And so you can scroll down here, and you can see all the various things, which I'm not going to click on, as they will very likely put me into uh, like showing you what I'm going to be doing later, as I've obviously been practicing the talk. But you can actually have a look and see what your state looked like earlier on. And you can actually do a diff and see what differences there are in the code. And you can also load in from here, uh, from the browser local history, you can load in the state of the code as it was um, some time in the past. So we've got a little bit of uh, a, a way of getting you back to your code if you, if you had something important in Compile Explorer. But that's not what I'm going to show here. I'm now going to change the language, and we've got lots of languages here, as I said before, uh, but one of the languages we've got here isn't really a language, it's called analysis, and I can actually paste in a snippet of an x86 assembly, and then I can choose LLVM MCA, which is the machine code analyzer that comes along with LLVM, as a compiler, and we're actually just running that on the piece of code here. And what it does is it understands the assembly code and it does a simulation of how all the various parts of the CPU interact and gives you some bound on how many cycles it's really going to take. So in this particular example, it simulates this as if it was in a loop and it runs it 100 times and it's telling me that there would be 400 instructions in 100 times through, fine, and it's telling me that there would only take 110 cycles, which is bonkers, right? Especially when you realize that this VP add da, 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 da here is actually adding eight four byte integers at the same time. So it's taking 110 cycles to add 800 integers together. Computers are fast. All right, oh, actually, one, oh, uh, no, I'm going all over the place. Okay, well, we'll go to the next bit here. So, so hopefully that would be enough to explain to uh, Jordan's boss that you could use the STL algorithms and it would just be fine, thank you very much. We don't need to worry about it anymore. Let's stop arguing about it. So another thing that's a personal bugbear of mine, this is somewhat unfashionable, is implementations tend to get pulled up into headers a lot. And that's fine. Templates often need to be in headers. ConstExpert often needs to be in headers. But sometimes trivial little accesses or even small functions, just because it's convenient, get pulled up into the header file and get defined in place inside the classes and functions that, that need them. And that can be for a variety of reasons. Often in my case, it's laziness. I can't be bothered to control tab to the CPP file and put it in there as well. And, you know, that's okay, I guess. But what that can lead to is... Um, an overdependence. If I change an implementation detail of my uh, function, everything that included my header will rebuild because I just changed the header file, right? And so all of the dependencies therein are dirty and need to be rebuilt. And that can make like a, a fast test develop, um, sort of test driven development cycle slower than it needs to be. Um, so obviously I can bring the um, implementation from the header file into the CPP file, but now suddenly the compiler has lost visibility of it and can't inline as effectively as it would otherwise be able to do. That can be a problem in performance critical code like Jordan might worry about. So what I might do, what I do, is I lean heavily on the link time optimization that compilers can do these days. And so I'm gonna try and show how link time optimization can solve this problem and let me write the implementation in a different translation unit from where it's used, but still get the inlining benefit. And Jordan would like to do this to show his boss that, again, this would be okay. And the thing about that is, oh no, wait, I'm just, I'm now I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go, I've got to go from a default empty view, more reset code and UI layout. All right. So, um, the thing about this is that I, in order to demonstrate this in Compiler Explorer, I need to compile two separate translation units and then link them together. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes we're only looking at one thing. So I'm gonna actually use this square as an example. And I'm gonna close uh, the assembly view. And so I'm gonna use that as my first file. I'm gonna have a function that squares a number. And I'm gonna add a new editor over here. And then just because it's slideware, I'm going to go extern int square int. So there exists a function somewhere else that squares a number, or rather that is called square. And then let's call int main, and I'm going to return square of 42. Oh, it's impossible to write square. Square of 42. Okay, so this, if we compile these separately, 
you would reasonably expect that there's nothing you could do. Main is cursed to call square. How can we demonstrate that this is not the case uh, with link time optimization? Well, we need to get Compiler Explorer to compile these two things together. So I'm going to go up to the top and I'm going to add one of our newest features, which is this IDE mode. And if I drag that over to the left-hand side, we've got the beginnings of a kind of IDE-style view. And at the moment, there's nothing included in the build. Um, we've just got two editor windows, which are both called C++ Source 1 and C++ Source 2. I'm going to add them into the build. So the first one I'm going to call square.cpp. Oh, if I can spell it right again, square.cpp. And the second one I'm going to call main.cpp. Fabulous. Uh, nothing interesting has happened yet. Now, I know that in order to do what I want, I would like to use CMake to properly specify how the program is going to be built. So I'm going to actually add a new editor window over here, which will default to being C++, but I'm going to ignore that and just say project main, and I'm going to say add executable. There's absolutely nothing that can go wrong trying to write C++ stuff on the fly. I'm going to call it main. It has main.cpp main and it has, don't worry, I'm going to show you a better way of doing this in a second, square.cpp and then finally I'm going to add that into the build but when I name it I'm going to call it cmakelists.txt. I'm going to tick the box up here that says actually I'd like you to use cmake, don't just try and run them all in the compiler regularly and the output for this is going to be called main and finally, I'm going to add a compiler, which is not now a compiler in the same sense. This is a compiler that compiles the project, not each individual file. So I'm going to drag a compiler, put it over on the right-hand side here, and you can see it's already compiling it. If I, actually, I'm going to move this all into one tab. So now we've got what's more like a traditional IDE lookout where I've got um, one window with all the editors in it. And yeah, we can see that we've now got main and square. They've been compiled and linked separately. If I bring up the output window from the bottom here, um, you can see it's actually running CMake and then compiling the things separately. Oh, it's off to the right-hand side here, but trust me, it's compiling them individually. If I turn on the optimizer over here with like O2, please work. <laughs> <laughs> Live demos all over the place. We can see that it's optimized the code, but it hasn't inlined. It's still doing a call here in main, second line down here, is jumping to square of int, which does the mole you might imagine and return, all that good stuff. But now I've finally got it into a situation where I can show that if we turn on FLTO, everything gets in line. Main has inlined the quarter square, and it's just returning the value of 42 squared. So hopefully, <laughs> and it works. Yes, thank you. Um, so that's all well and good. We can show that like a more complicated project can be set up and that we can do some sort of more global optimization things. It might be enough to convince Jordan's boss that link time optimization is a way forward. Um, certainly for the release builds, anyway. Um, if you turn it on for your debug builds, all you've done is deferred the work that you need to do to your debug uh, link, which, doesn't, which sort of removes some of the benefits of it. Now, I told you that there was an easier way of doing this because, you've, you know, it's fairly complicated to get things set up, as you might imagine. One of our other new features is this thing at the top called templates. If I click templates, we have some pre-canned layouts of the site. And um, one of them is a C++ CMake layout. And if I click this, it's just going to load the site up with a much, an even more advanced example than the one I've just given you, where we have various... Uh, libraries being used, we have a resource that's actually available to the executable when it's running, and this one, in fact, you know, this hello.txt has hello world the end, and this program actually prints out the output, so here we're actually executing the program at the bottom right here that some people probably can't see. But um, this you could use as a starting point to then jump off from to do a more complicated example of your own. And um, hot off the presses, so the problem with having people knowing that you're going to do a presentation called What's New in Compiler Explorer is it challenges all of the developers who are doing all of the work to keep adding new features to make my job harder. Um, so at uh, the weekend, um, there is now a way to save the state that you've just made here as a user template, and it will be stored in your lo browser's local storage. So if you have um, like a, a particular layout that you like, you can store it as a, st as a, as a template and use it yourself. Okay, so heading back. Oh. Back. There we are. Okay, and then that was that. Okay. So what do we cover in this section? I gave you a sort of tour of some of the basic functionality, showed you the diff view, which has been around a little while, but maybe you haven't used. Uh, the analysis language is an analysis uh, which allows you to look at how the performance of opcodes uh, actually fit together, which is like the kind of stuff that I like. 
Uh, the IDE mode is sort of allows you to do arbitrarily complicated CMake by based projects. Um, I say arbitrarily complicated, it's bounded by about the 30 second timeout that we give you before we say, hey, you've had enough compute time, thank you very much. And I showed you some of the templates. Okay, let's talk about Mason. Mason is a online C++ trainer. Uh, maybe they have some part-time work at a local university and they teach students there as well. Um, they mainly want to use the site to proselytize C++ and share how best practice, sorry, share best practices and how one might uh, um, use them in, in, uh, in, in a real code base, but without necessarily everyone who's following along having to set up a whole IDE themselves and, and all of the things that go with that. So how can we use Compiler Explorer to teach? So one of the things you might do if you are in a lecture hall full, and I'm abundantly aware there are some people who use <laughs> Compiler Explorer to do their own training in this very room, but you might give your students a little challenge, and you can't quite see this, it's slightly off the side here, but what I've done here is I've written a little code snippet that says, bool contains zero, std vector of int ref, and it's left as an ex exercise to my students how they might fill this in, as to say whether this particular vector return, contains a zero value. Now, I'm old school, and the way that I might write it would be for, and again, I can feel the weight of some people in the audience looking at me, if I, I is equal to zero return true. So, obviously that's disgusting, don't do that. It doesn't even compile. What am I doing wrong? Oh, because it's called V. <clears throat> but it works, you could argue. Um, it's not very elegant. So I might want to use this newfangled ranges thing if I wanted to like correct myself and say, okay, let's use ranges. So what would this look like? So std ranges find uh, v at zero is not equal to std end of end of v. Okay, well, no member named no member named ranges in namespace std. Oh, that's sad. Even though we're using you know clang sixteen. So I know what the problem is here. The problem is we need to tell the compiler, please use a new version of the standard. And obviously I could go up into the box up here as we would have done and type dash std equals and then, what is it, 2b, 2c, 2d, I don't know. We have uh, a little new thing up here called overrides. Overrides let us, lets us override some of the default things that the compiler does in a sort of more principled way than giving you a bag of command line options and saying get on with it yourself. Uh, so popping this up gives us this window where you can type in environment variables that the compiler will have set while it's running. That's actually not very important for C++, but there are some other languages where environment variables can affect how the compiler works. Don't ask. Um, and then we've chosen a few of the options that we know have many outputs that we can interrogate the compiler by parsing its help string and saying, what all do you support? What specific compiler um, you've got selected can control what things you support. And so one of those is like the target architecture. And as you can see, there's a lot of architectures that Clang supports these days, including, I don't know what hexagon is, and ARM64, there's one I do know. Um, when you're running Clang, it by default on Compiler Explorer will use GCC's STL, and it will pick um, by default the version of GCC that was like most recently re re released when that version of Clang was released. But we support all these other tool chains now, and we could actually pick any number of these, and we will use that as a tool chain to Clang to say, get your STL from this version of GCC. But the thing that's important to me is to get set the standard version. And I can click this, and I can go and choose C++ 2B was the answer. That was the question. And so now if I close this, Hopefully, it compiles. Fantastic. Okay, so now my student has, uh, has got a successful um, solution to the problem which doesn't use a raw loop. Um, and I'm certain that there are better ways of phrasing it even than this. Um, but, you know, if you're teaching C++, is this really what you want to show your students? Maybe. I mean, that's what that helped me learn. That's my background. But a lot of people don't see assembly in the day-to-day life of their, um, their work. But, you know, we've all stared at it before now. And another thing that we support that's relatively new is the ability to mouse over and get all of the information about what this particular opcode means. In particular, like, I might be able to guess what MOV does. Remember, MOV moves. It doesn't move. It copies. Naming is hard. Um, 
compares, jumps, maybe that makes sense, but setni, I don't know what setni is, but apparently it sets the destination operand to zero or one, depending on the flags. Oh, okay. And if you want to get more information, you can actually right click and go to view assembly documentation, and we actually link off to a site that parses out all of the x86 instructions and has a huge amount of detail on it. And very recently, um, we've supported ARM and ARM64, and I think RISC-V is in the pipeline. So people are adding the different instruction sets, architectures in. Um, there was one more thing I needed to do. Oh, yes, I remember. So another thing is that a big list of instructions like that, again, is fine for me, but some people learn in different ways. People learn by doing. Some people are very visual learners. And another way of perhaps understanding what this code actually does compared to what I wrote on the left-hand side is to see how it flows. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to add a control flow graph view. And just while I'm here, a quick note. All of the things that are on the add new dropdown are panes that are kind of intimately involved in the compiler. Either we have to know that you've got them open so that we can pass additional flags to the compiler, or we have to look at intermediate files that the compiler leaves behind afterwards. But essentially, they're very much linked with the compilation process. Whereas these tools that I'll show you more of later on the left-hand side far left-hand side, right-hand side, other left. Um, all of these can run independently of the compiler once the compilation has happened. So that's why we separate them. User experience is not necessarily our strong suit. So, I mean, from your point of view, perhaps you don't care why they're different. But anyway, I'm going to go to the add new pane. I'm going to add a control flow graph. Uh, another thing I notice people do is you can click these, and it will add it to the, the view. But you can just drag directly off of here, which is what I do. So I'm just going to click and drag immediately and put this where I want it to go, which is down here. And in fact, I'm going to then maximize this. And then I'm going to click Zoom Out. And what we can see here is a control flow graph of the code that was generated. And in this instance, each of these blocks represents a basic block, which is a sequence of instructions that runs from the beginning to the end without any jumps. And then it always ends with either a return or um, a conditional jump or a non-conditional jump. So what we've got at the top is some sort of setup code. I'm not going to go over it in depth. Uh, if, if the jump was taken, it goes to the green line, and I follow the green line, it goes to the end. Okay, so there's a jump to the end after the beginning. There's a second, uh, the red line is what happens if the jump is not taken. Um, and we can sort of follow down and see that there is one of these lines here that goes all the way back round up to the top. And so that's where our loop lives. And so if you're more of a visual learner, maybe that's another way of seeing the same information and extracting some value. Or maybe if it's a more complicated function, this would be valuable to you. But obviously, I'm trying to show something that I can fit in a, in a slide. So I'm going to close that down. Um, I also mentioned that this was for Clang. Um, we, um, obviously, we support many thousands of compilers, as I showed on one of the other slides there. And like, this is an unwieldy list. I'm sure you'll be uh, very much familiar with it. Some people don't know that you can just type sort of arbitrary search strings up here. So if I'm looking for a risk, five, GCC, trunk, like it's just going to search and find the things that um, I've typed there. And this little star on the right-hand side here, this lets you favorite them, which means they don't appear at the top of the list, which is helpful. But a very new feature is to click either the icon here or this pop-out that's come up. And then you get a full-on list of every compiler we have and some extra ways of filtering them by the architecture that they target, including my favorite, 6502. Um, and for Clang and MinGW and NVC, all these type of things here. So this is another way of finding the compilers that, uh, that you need to in order to do whatever experiment you're doing. And we have an awful lot of them. OK, let's go back to the slides. Right. Of course, while I'm excited by control flow graphs and assembly code and everything like that, most people weirdly, are interested in what the, the, the program actually does, not what it looks like compiled. So we obviously, we've supported execution for a little while now. Please load. So wary of the Wi-Fi not being too, there we are, too good. So, you know, this is a slightly more involved version. I've actually got like a little test main function here that says, you know, does it have a zero and calling the function there using std c out. Um, the assembly code, I'm not interested in it really. But, you know, I spent some time setting some flags and the overrides and all that kind of stuff. But now I want to turn it into a, more of an execution-only view. And I can either add up here, sorry, not up there, I add here, add new execution-only view and drag it over and then it would only execute the code. It wouldn't bother to show me all the uh, assembly code and all that stuff. But then I'd have to copy all the flags and things across. So much easier is to go over to this side and go add a new executor from this. So I'm going to pop this down here. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to pop it over here. I'm going to close the assembly view. And now we've just got uh, an execution 
window on the right hand side here, which is great. And you know, I can sort of demonstrate that it works by deleting the zero and it should say uh, false now. It did change. So false with no zero and true with a zero. But that's kind of unsatisfying because it says vector of dot, 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 because it's a pain, isn't it? It's a pain to do the output of a vector. But um, I know that soon std format and std print will be coming my way. Uh, but I also know that I haven't managed to get them to work yet. So I'm going to actually use fmt, libfmt. So I'm going to include fmt format.h and it's going to say that doesn't exist. And I'm like, well, that's a shame. I use that in my project. Why can't I use it on Compiler Explorer? Well, thankfully, if I can find the button, where is it gone? The book, thank you. <laughs> I'm being prompted down there. Um, the resolution means it, it, we've squished up them just to icons. That would normally say libraries next to it, as well as having the little book icon. <clears throat> and here we pull up the library view. And in here I can search for a library. We've got many of them. And one of them, of course, is FMT. Just like some of the other views that you've seen, we can favorite them. So I'm going to go, go for gold and go for the latest version, which has only just been put in. Um, I can delete it um, from the list by clicking that button. I can favor it by making a button over here. And now next time I can just click FMT 10. Fabulous. So now we are including FMT format.h, which means I can write this in terms of, now you get to laugh at my typing, you know, uh, vector. Now, because I want to put braces in here, I'm gonna have to double the braces, and then I'm gonna have to put the brace thing in the middle. Has a zero, question mark, splat, and it's gonna be FMT join, I comma, comma separated list, and then has zero I, and I don't have to worry about bool alpha or all that kind of nonsense, because thankfully FMT and et al do the right thing. And drum roll, has he typed it right? <gasps> Yay, there it is. So um, now we can actually have a slightly nicer view where if I do delete the zero, um, it will print the fact that it doesn't have a zero eventually. Good, there we are. So we've got libraries there, and I've shown you, you know, how um, to include them and how to generate an execute-only view, and also how to pick your compilers in a more um, compelling way. So moving back into sort of my personal territory of things I like to talk about, and I think there's a talk going on right now about how linkers work, um, you might want to demonstrate, especially if you're doing like more of an operating system level class, how the linker works and how um, the bits sort of after compilation fit in with the compiler. And so I might use this to teach um, by showing my class. Um, here is a file on the left-hand side. It's got a main function, and it's calling a function that I say exists somewhere. There exists a function called some function that returns me an int. And then I can compile it on the right-hand side. And Compiler Explorer, by default, tells the compiler to just output the text that it would feed to an assembler, which means that we don't have to worry about the symbols. If they are not defined, no one cares. It's just ASCII. So that's what we're seeing on the right-hand side over here. Um, but if I want to show how the linker works, I need to actually compile it to binary and see what is in the ELF file that I know exists um, in the, as the .o. In the old world, we used to have compile to binary. And compile to binary would then compile and link the whole executable and then disassemble it afterwards. And that's what you would see in the view. But if I tried to do that, which is this link to binary option, we've renamed it. Um, we would get this error, undefined reference to some function. Well, it stands to reason. I haven't defined some function. But we have a new feature where you can compile to binary object. And we leave it as the .o file, and then we do some extra work to understand some of the things that are left out of a .o file that are in a folder executable. So if I click compile to binary object, now we can see it has compiled. I can see the opcodes. And I can see on line four, there is a call to nine which is main plus nine, which doesn't sound like a call to some function at all. In fact, you can see, if you look at the opcode view, E8, which is the opcode for call, and then the address it's calling is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, because we don't know where some function is, because until we're linked, nobody knows where some function comes from, right? It may not be defined, or it may be defined in some other place. The linker's job is to find some function, give it an address somewhere in my program, and then come back and patch this opcode so that it points to the right location. And that's exactly what we're seeing on line five. What we're doing is we're interleaving the um, relocations that the linker is, uh, is told about, which is in a separate section of the ELF file. And so what the linker is told is, hey, go find some function, take its address minus four for reasons, 
and poke it in address 5. And address 5 just so happens to be the start of the 00000. 000 000 000. And that's how the linker is going to do its job. So that's a cool thing to do. But we can do more than that. Um, we can add some various tools to actually look at the output of this .o file, including things like nm, which is the Unix uh, dump me the symbol table. And unfortunately, there's a small issue where it doesn't resize to the big size here. So this is me dumping the symbol table that's in that .o file. Um, it's not demangled by default, but I can pass in arguments to any of these tools. So dash capital C is demangled, so you can see it says use some function there now. Um, we can add another tool like readelf. Readelf just allows me to uh, read any kind of information about the elf file format whatsoever, which again, if you're teaching how this stuff all fits together, can be really useful. So I can get arguments in here and do dash sc, which means dump everything, or dump the symbol table as well. Um, and a demangle. And so here I can see like the various sections and where things live, and it says, you know, like, here is the undefined sum function. So there is some kind of communication to the linker that says, these are the things I need you to go find, and then the relocation say, once you've found everything, this is how to patch the executable to generate something that's going to work. So that lets you go a little bit deeper into how things all fit together. Um, none of us these days, I hope, are programming without some kind of static analysis of our code. Um, there are just too many ways to, to go wrong in C++. The compiler's warnings and errors and things like that are amazing, but there are some things that are either too expensive to do all the time or can have false positives, but nonetheless are worth running. And Clang Tidy is some, one such tool. We support Clang Tidy. And so here is yet another sort of straw implementation of something which doesn't quite fit. So let's just quickly, whoops, let's quickly break everything by typing the wrong keys everywhere. All right, so this is, you know, world's worst um, login system where we have a free function called uh, validate, it's given a username and a password, and if the hash of the password matches the hash that we looked up in some database somewhere, you can log in, hooray. This is not how Compiler Explorer will be doing its logging in if we ever do logging in, fear not. Um, but, you know, it works, but I'm sure most of you are sort of recoiling at the lack of some things that are on this screen, but like the compiler has all the warnings on, uh, wall, wearer, wextra, in Clang, which is quite chatty about such things, and yet everything is fine. Let's see what Clang Tidy says. So I'm gonna add a tool, I'm gonna add Clang Tidy, and I'm gonna put it down here and get rid of the output, and then I'm gonna preemptively scale up to 24 because I know that it will have forgotten. In large and eight. Okay, by default it says nothing because none of the um, uh, checks are on, but I know that I can pass dash dash checks equals, and I'm going to deliberately only turn on the ones I care about, perf star. And now Clang Tidy is going to run, and it's going to give you, presumably your mind was already thinking, I need to change this bit of code. And it says, yes, the parameter username is copied, but you only pass it by reference. So why the heck don't you just take it by reference? If you can, if you can take it by reference, right? And so... And now, you know, const, this, I'm old, again, you can see const, um, what is it, west const, whatever this, this way is, really, whatever the formatter will do for me automatically. And now, we get the clean bill of health that we wanted, everything's lovely, um, and hopefully we can use this to start teaching students again that, like, you should be setting up projects from the get-go to have these kinds of checks available to you straight away so that you immediately catch the kind of mistakes that you might make. Um, even seasoned programmers will make these mistakes, right? Um, Bit of a shout out to one of our commercial sponsors. So Sonar have given us a license that we can use. And um, this is like the best motivating example that I could get from them that wasn't shown up by some of the other anal an an analyzers. analyzers. Um, so here is a, a classic way to not use concepts correctly. Um, I have to give you a moment to look at it, but this is not how to use concepts. But it looks compelling. I, if I didn't know much more about concepts, and I don't, um, I would probably be fine with that. That looks good. You know, this is two different implementations of hash that take either a numeric value or a textual value. Right, and I've not implemented them, obviously, because that would be awful. Um, but luckily, sonar, which we can just add over here, will tell us what is wrong. And it tells me, you can't read that, and I've not made a good job of, um, let me just maximize it and do this, because I'm running low on time. Uh, a requires expression should not contain unevaluated concept checks, which is exactly what we were doing here. Um, those things were just basically, uh, it requires that that compiles, which that will compile for any T, but it doesn't care whether it's true or false. It's just like, sure, that's, that's a valid piece of code. 
great. Um, so if I were to actually do this properly, I would get rid of that whole bit there, I think. I'm gonna, this is, I don't go off piste, really, but does it work? Please work. Okay, it's now only complaining about the second one. Whether that's correct or not, I don't actually know, but that's an example where you can use static code analyzers. So what do we cover in this section? The tooltips, control flow graph, the various binary tools that you can run and the way that you can now link in different ways, the override window that lets you pick um, different architectures, C++ types, and other things as we add them in, static analyzers, the execute only view, um, I didn't show you, but another thing you can do in the execute only view is passing command line parameters and standard in to the program so that you can do even more advanced like poking and testing. And uh, we looked at the libraries and how you can link those and pick from the list of library objects. Let's talk about Joanna. So Joanna is um, one of those people who loves to torture C++ compilers. She likes to write code that really pushes to the very boundary of what is C++ in terms of the most recent standard and some of the more edge cases of how compilers uh, parse code. Um, but she also likes to tinker inside the compiler. She likes to actually open up the compiler and work out how various things happen inside of the compiler itself. So I'm certain that this is not too unfamiliar to use, but I'm gonna use this as an example. This is not Joanna quality um, C++ torture. This is actually the most vexing parse, or one of the many ways that you can write the most vexing parse. So obviously what we were doing on the left-hand side here is we wanted to basically very complicatedly cast a float to an integer. And so I make a temporary variable called as int, and I use a horrible old school cast of int of f to do it, and then I just return it. And the compilers, to their credit, are giving me warnings like, cannot do that, and if I open on the right one, add a pair of parentheses to declare a variable, Par parentheses were disambiguated as a function declaration, which you know is, is a clue for go Google most vexing parse, which I think it should say. But if we knew this was the most vexing parse, but we're interested in like, well, what are the nuts and bolts of it? One of the things we do is on these um, add new things, again, where we, we know which compiler we're running and we know that we can potentially change the flags of the compiler to get extra information out of it. So for LLVM-based compilers, or rather Clang-based compilers specifically for this, I can get a view that gives me the abstract syntax tree. So I'm gonna drag this view down over here. And now, even though it didn't compile properly, I have a little hierarchy of all of the different things that went into parsing that bit of code. And as I mouse over them, it's gonna show me where they are in the input, just like it would be for the assembly code. And so here we can see, apparently this was parsed as a function decal, which you know is what the error message told us, but this might let you drill into it a little bit more. And just because it hurts me so much, I'm gonna just go and fix it. Um, let's do it this way. And I can't even leave this bare cast like this, because again, it's so horrible. Something like this, if we were actually gonna fix it. And now it, comp it correctly, com uh, correctly compiles, and I can even look down the tree here and see what more clever things are going on in here. So this sometimes could be quite useful if you're trying to understand how the compiler is actually parsing whatever code you've given it, given that maybe you think it should be um, understood in a different way. There are other things that we can get out of the compiler. Um, obviously, compiler authors have to debug their compilers, and so they put all sorts of traps and backdoors and things into them, and we now can plug into that and, and visualize them in different ways. So this is, I was gonna say, Hannah's favorite bit of code. It's my favorite piece of code, really. So on the left-hand side, this is a function to count the number of one bits in an UN64. And you can see there's some magical bit manipulation I've done here, but critically, there's a while loop here with like an uncertain terminating condition, right? While value, do some things like that. So that's kind of involved. There's a lot of control flow going on there. But on the other side over here, there is, ignore the C move, there is one instruction, popkunt. This is a population count instruction, which we mouse over and it says, this instruction calculates the number of bits set to one. I think you just take a moment to realize quite how clever the compiler is because it's read my terrible code and gone, wait a second, there's an instruction that can do that. I'll just use the instruction instead. Amazing, no intrinsics, no ma magic. But like, to the curious, like um, Joanna, you might go, well, how is it achieving this miraculous uh, ability? So one of the things we do is, show the optimization pipeline that LLVM goes through. So if I drag this down here, or in fact, I'm just gonna drag it and maximize it because we don't have the screen real estate here. What we've got is a view where on the left-hand side, every one of the passes internal to the compiler is run one after another, 
and we show a difference view for the internal representation before and after that pass ran. If it changes, we highlight it green. So at the moment, we've selected annotate, annotation to metadata pass and nothing changed. So there's nothing exciting going on here. But we can see SROA pass on count set bits. If I click on this, we can see that there's quite a big change here. And what SROA is, is a scalar replacement of aggregates. I'm going to look at JF at the bottom here. <laughs> Someone, and um, uh, uh, you can see that quite a big substantial change happened here. Lots of things moved around. And uh, that's all great. And if we sort of click down here, we can see how various things change. That's not obvious what changed. Here's another one. And I kind of know from anecdote, really, that the way that these things tend to work inside compilers is that they try and canonify your code so that through these various transformations, it doesn't matter if you write a while loop or a for loop or a do while or whatever, they end up as looking the same so that things like a piece of code that could recognize a population count always gets the same inputs. So if I'd written that previous bit of code as a do while, or if I'd written it as a, a, a for loop, then it should all boil down to the same internal representation. And then one of these passes, which if I remember rightly is loop deletion pass, can come in and say, ah, I recognize this loop. It can be deleted and replaced with a single thing. And although it's not very obvious from this junk of color up here, um, on the left hand side, we've got all these loop-based stuff in the while body. On the right-hand side, the bo body has been completely deleted and there has been a replacement to some internal intrinsic llvm.ctpop.i64, which is where the magic has happened. So you could then go and look in the code, find where this loop, loop deletion pass is, and maybe go and understand how it was able to make this magic trick happen. And then as we go right to the very, very bottom of this, and this list of um, thingamajigs is long, you'll see that the code slowly becomes more and more like the actual x86 machine code we know it will ultimately have to be. And so here at the very end, these kind of internal things look like the pop count instruction and the CMOV that we saw from before. So that's pretty cool. Compilers are amazing. All right. Um, another thing, if you are uh, keen on torturing compilers and seeing whether or not you know, your particular trick works on all the compilers. Maybe you're even a compiler author and you know that it works on your compiler, but it, does it work on everyone else's compiler? Um, there's the will it blend, uh, will it compile link here. So here is, oh, come on. Don't fail me now, phew. Um, here's my contain zero, and obviously it works just nice on Clang trunk, but um, if I wanted to check it on GCC and MSVC and A and other compiler, I could obviously have loads of views here and I could end up with some tiny little space where I'm typing in or I'd have to put them all in thousands of tabs so they're all hidden away and then I'd have to click through the tabs to see if it actually worked or not. Or I could add a conformance view which allows me to add compilers and I can say this one is std equals C++ 2B and what am I going to do here? I'm going to do, so here's my favorites here, x86 GCC trunk and what are you? The green tick means it compiled okay. Um, We've got x86 clang here. Green tick means it's compiled okay. Let's do msvc and hope that that's actually working today. Uh, oh, arm64, sure, whatever. Stood c++ latest. c++ latest. Latest. Live demos, everybody. There we go. So those have all compiled um, fine. And as I kind of change the code around over here, it's going to recompile all of them and tell me that it compiles just fine on each of them. And if it didn't for whatever reason, then this would go red, you'd mouse over it and it would show you what the error was and you could click a button up over here and open it as a window. So that can be very useful if one of two things, one, um, you're interested in like many compilers, up to 15 we support in that window and whether they compile your code or not, or two, if you want to run up my AWS bill by doing thousands and thousands of compiles for every time you type the keystrokes, <laughs> which you're welcome to do for what it's worth. I don't want to ever feel that you can't do that. Okay, so what do we cover in this? We covered the AST view, um, the LLVM pass viewer. Uh, it, it essentially, um, sorry, additionally, if you were to pick GCC, you'd have the GCC equivalents that um, allow you to look at the internals of GCC as it's compiling. Um, we looked at, yeah, the pass viewer, we looked to look at the conformance view. So um, I've got one more. Let's talk about, let's talk about Matt. Matt is a late 40s software developer who is trying to recapture his youth. Um, he, uh, he likes to write emulators in his spare time, such as it is. Um, he somehow thinks that a computer from 1984 is the best computer that was ever made. And, um, 
and he's standing on stage in front of you. So this is absolutely uh, not a midlife crisis in any me meaningful way. But another thing we support is the extremely important 6502 target, target. Now, I've got an admission here. I didn't write this code on the left-hand side here. My, my best friend uh, did. Uh, but this is 6502 assembly, and it compiles to, yes, you guessed it, 6502 assembly, um, except that it's been assembled, so you get to see over here. And also, this is a macro assembler on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, it's been expanded out. Um, and that's all great, and you're like, that's wonderful. I wonder what it does. What does this do, do you think? Well, let's find out. So if you've got one of these, and we support not just the BBC Micro, which is, of course, the best computer ever made, um, we support the Commodore 64 now, is that right? And we support the, um, uh, um, what else, the NES, I think, and the um, Sega Master System, which was my favorite console growing up. So it doesn't work out very well in here. It turns out, um, it turns out yeah, that we, we weren't too worried about color blindness uh, in 1988. But, you know, um, there we are. We can run and emulate these things in the browser inside Compiler Explorer, which is, of course, extremely useful to all of you. <laughs> but wait, there's more. I'm running low on time, but um, there is a ton more than this. And so um, it's worth noting that, oh, yeah, actually something which only dropped recently at this weekend was we have a view, a stack viewer now, which lets you see at every line how much stack has been allocated and how much is live and active. And that's one of those other add new dot, dot, dots that you can drop down. Um, there's an, a, an optimization viewer which does the same thing, but every time it, it tries to run an optimization pass and fails, it will annotate the line and say, hey, I would have been able to vectorize this, but because we jumped out of the loop early, um, the vectorizer couldn't run. Things like that. So there's just tons of things. I'm sure now you've seen where they all are. You'll give them a play and sort of try and work out what they are. Again, user experience is not our strong suit. We are all software engineers and C++ engineers mostly too, so writing TypeScript is uh, quite a stretch. But we have statistics. If you're interested in how uh, things work behind the scenes, and um, you can go to stats.compilerexplorer.com and you'll get something which looks like this. Uh, we do about three million compilations a week. Um, we now support GPU execution, which means that if you like to run CUDA stuff, you can actually run it on Compiler Explorer. And um, you might occasionally get errors with that because we're cheapskates and the GPU instances are super expensive. So uh, we sort of bid for them and we don't bid very much for them. So sometimes if uh, probably some of our fine uh, trading colleagues here are using the GPU instances on AWS we, that we're priced out of the market for a bit. We also support Windows execution with a big asterisk. Um, at the moment, um, there are two places where Windows compilations happen. They either happen um, in um, a Microsoft's data center where they run a copy of Compiler Explorer that we proxy to, and they've got all of the compilers installed there. Or we run Windows compilers only for the free ones that we've got access to. We don't, unfortunately, the EULA prevents us from installing the, uh, the Microsoft compilers on our site. Um, we're working with Microsoft on that front. But if it's running on our infrastructure, we can run uh, execution. So if you pick uh, MinGW or Clang, one of the Clangs that supports Windows, then you're running one of our instances and you'll be able to like, run the code as well. But again, results may vary and we're working on it actively. So I'm gonna take a moment here to just talk about my future dreams. Um, I obviously, compilers, languages, platforms will always be added. By platforms, I mean I'd love to be able to execute ARM code. I'd love to be able to execute RISC-V code, AN, other CPUs, and we can either do that through emulation or we can do that by actually running instances that run ARM. Um, Logins is a mixed bag. I would ideally love to support it because being able to store all your short links as like yours so that you could delete them or you know, re redo them or even we can personalize short links, which is something I would like to be able to do so that you can actually make a nice name for your short links. That would be great, but we need to be able to support logging in and that comes with a whole bunch of uh, interesting uh, cross-world um, personally identifying inf information like legalities, so we have to be a bit careful about that. Um, I've had enough run-ins with that kind of stuff. It would be cool, wouldn't it, if you could share a link with somebody to a Compiler Explorer session and then they could see you typing and moving things around in it. That would be awesome. The system under the hood could support it. We know that the Monaco editor that we use does support this kind of thing because it's what drives Visual Studio Code, but it's a lot of work. Um, and the thing that would really sort of tie everything together for me personally would be to have like a fully functional x86 simulator where we simulate and visualize the entirety of the comp compilation flow into assembly instructions and then show you the flow as the, the CPU goes through it with all of the branch prediction going on, with all of the, um, the caches and memory hierarchies, all that kind of good stuff. And that would bring everything together that I love. But 
maybe when I retire. Um, so, quick thanks to the sponsors who make the site possible and to my patrons and GitHub um, supporters and those who donate on PayPal. Obviously, my team and my, my company, Aquatic, um, who for letting me come here and talk about this. Um, that's what I've got. So, if anyone has questions on it, um, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs>